Ah, it's time to chill out and get ready for a mediocre Q&A live stream. If you're old enough, grab yourself your favorite adult beverage. And if you're not, stick with apple juice. Put your feet up and relax. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. And now let's cue up the intro music. Hello, everybody. Hopefully you guys are doing okay, I guess. I don't know. That's kind of, I, I, I shouldn't wish, I guess I should wish you well. But anyways, it is what it is. I always stumble over that one. So um, I'm going to start this off like I normally or I have been doing just because we've had a lot of new viewers. My name is Chris. I'm in air conditioning and refrigeration or HVACR service tech here in Southern California. Um, I specialize in restaurant refrigeration and air conditioning. I make uh, these YouTube videos on YouTube to share just a little bit of knowledge that I have. And mainly they're geared towards my own employees. And I decided to make them public. I'm just kind of giving the cliff notes of it all. Um, when I started making these videos, you know, I realized that I was getting so many questions that I decided to go ahead and start doing these live streams as a way to kind of save my sanity because I was staring at my phone all day long answering comments. So I use this live stream as a method to answer the YouTube comments, okay? Um, I really appreciate you guys stopping by to check out the stream. Uh, usually I have a list of things to talk about, and then uh, also I'm uh, totally open to answering questions within the chat. The only thing I ask of you is, is that if you guys do have questions, please put them in caps lock. Myself or my moderator will pay attention, and you know the caps lock is really what draws us into the questions because usually there's so many things going on inside there that sometimes there's conversations within conversations, and it's hard to keep track of it all. So just do me a favor, throw the questions in caps lock. If I miss your guys' question, okay, put them in there again, all right? Usually there's so much going on, sometimes it's hard to get to them. I'll usually be upfront and honest and tell you, hey, I'm not going to answer that question. So if I haven't addressed it, just keep throwing it in. You're not going to make us upset, okay? Unless a moderator tells you to stop or something. So, But um, yeah, we definitely got all kinds of interesting stuff to talk about. Uh, usually like to cover the last two videos. And then I always want to get to the chat too. And then I got, you know, all that good stuff. So hello to everybody that's in here. And thanks again for coming in. Um, I want to start this off with something that I wanted to address. So, you know, over the last year and a half, people have chose to support this stream, uh, my videos via Patreon, YouTube membership, Super Chats. And I'm super grateful for that stuff. 
And I've been kind of going back and forth on what to do with that. I know that we're in a really, really hard time right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to encourage those of you that have chosen to support the channel. Um, if you need to, please stop the support. Okay. Um, I, I appreciate everything, but I know that right now everybody needs the little bit of cash that they can get their hands on. So please don't feel obligated once you've started or anything like that. I, I assume that you guys would, would hit stop if you really, really needed to, but please, I encourage you guys and you're not going to offend me. It's going to be okay. So, you know, if you guys have chosen to support over this time, please, you know, if you guys feel the need to go ahead and pause it, stop it. You can start it up again some other time if you want to. But I really want you guys to save your cash for yourselves because I know that everybody's kind of struggling right now in this really strange time. And there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, a lot of worry, I guess I should say. So um, why don't we just go ahead and start this off right and go ahead and dive into that. So, you know, everybody knows what's going on. We got this craziness going across the world right now. And uh, I'm here in Southern California and, you know, 99% of my work is restaurant refrigeration. Well, the restaurants have pretty much all shut down. Okay. They're still open, but the, the, you know, they're not breaking their equipment basically because they're so dead slow. You know, they're only allowed to serve to go. So, you know, we are pretty much dead. I've been sitting in, at home. All my guys are sitting at home. Nobody's really working. I think I ran one single service call today. Um, my whole company, you know, we're a small company too. So it sucks. It really does. I will, I will look at the chat here in a minute, but I'm just going to finish talking about this. So, um, definitely a scary time, but you know what? We're going to get through it. Um, it's just going to be a challenge. It's something we have to work at. So, you know, it's, uh, it's definitely, I, 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 I don't have any advice to say, Hey, this is how we're going to fix it or anything. We're just going to take it one day at a time and do what we got to do. You know? Okay. I'm going to take a look at the chat here real quick. Um, let me see. Uh, um, Steven, Mo um, Montanez, you asked me why I didn't install the hinge kit on the fan prior to wiring it in. Uh, that was just a mistake. I mean, you know, I just kind of got ahead of myself, started wiring it in, thinking that, uh, and what he's referring to is, is the video that I just released about the exhaust fan replacement where I showed the crane lift and did the hand signals and all that stuff. So um, let me go ahead and recap on that one. So we had a, a service call about a week prior on that exhaust fan about a funny noise coming from it. And what I found was the whole insides of the fan had separated. So what I did was I quoted to the customer that, um, you know, hey, let's go ahead and replace the power pack because it was a captive air fan and you can actually buy a power pack that comes with the motor and the wheel already attached. Uh, the customer declined that quote and then just went ahead and replaced the fan. They actually ordered their own equipment. So they ordered a new fan and I installed it. And doing the installation, I went ahead and wired in the electrical first and then realized that I made the electrical too short because I planned on putting the hinge kit somewhere where it didn't work out. So I had to redo everything. So that's what he's referring to. So, all right, let's go ahead and see what else. Um, what happens if my company shuts down due to the pandemic? Mr. Johnny Boy. Well, first off, my company is not shut down. Let's go ahead and address that one right now, too, because a lot of people have asked questions. So uh, in California, we do have a stay at home order. OK, what that means is, is the governor came on and just basically said all non-essential personnel needs to stay at home. No groups, no anything like that. OK. A lot of the media is hyping that as all kinds of different things. We have a stay-at-home order across the whole state of California. That does not mean that the police are standing at your door waiting for you to walk out so they can lock you up, okay? It's a voluntary stay-at-home order. They encourage you to stay home. Now, they do say that, you know, if they find that you're going out and going to large gatherings and stuff like that, they'll give you a citation. But, guys, it's not being enforced. It's just more of a a voluntary stay at home order. Okay. There is what they call essential and non-essential personnel as uh, construction workers, electricians, tr basically all the trades are considered essential personnel. So long as they're not doing new construction. Uh, uh, again, there's so many different, you know, red, so much red tape to this. So new construction technically is not allowed unless it's essentially needed for infrastructure kind of a stuff. Okay. But service work is totally perfect. You know, you can do that. Um, I don't have to carry a notice in my van driving around. There's not roadblocks or anything like that. Okay. The media hypes everything up. It's, it's just basically when you get up in the morning, like when I went and ran a call this morning, I'm driving down the freeway. There's probably about 10,000 less cars on the freeway, 15,000 less cars around, you know, and 
the roads are a little bit clearer, but I mean, there's still people moving about, all right? All the, the retail workers are still going to work, all the grocery store workers, all the doctor's offices, the police departments, anything essential, you know? I mean, I think they even break it down to essential personnel as exterminators, right? So they can keep pests and different things out of the building. So there's still quite a few people moving about and working, whether or not that's correct, you know, who knows, but, you know, so it's not what the media makes it up to be. Um, it's definitely crazy. You know, a lot of people are scared. The grocery stores are definitely packed, that kind of stuff. My family and myself, we thankfully are doing okay. We have plenty of food. We have plenty of everything. Um, and we're safe. So, all right, I'm going to go ahead and get to a couple more questions here in the chat. Um, let's see. Hope my, yeah, we are healthy. Um, yeah, it's, it's a bummer. A lot of people are getting layoff notices. You know, the plus side about a layoff, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Being laid off has got to suck. Okay. Um, being a business owner and knowing that you only have so many months of, of, of capital saved up to, you know, float the business is also another scary thing, not downplaying anybody's fear. I mean, there's fear on all different sides of it. Okay. So, um, you know, we just take it one day at a time. You can't let it worry you too much. Um, let me go ahead and get down to here. Just kind of get into these questions right now. Um, uh, do I see a lot of carrier compressor failures? Drew Pierce. Uh, as far as carrier, no, I, I'd say I see an equal amount of compressor failures all across the line. And majority of the time, I'm going to be honest with you, whether it comes to any manufacturer, carrier, Linux, train, the failures are usually related to installation problems or maintenance problems for the most part. Occasionally, you have some weird design system that's doomed to fail. But for the most part, most of it is this user error you know, via lack of maintenance or, you know, lack of uh, proper installation that causes compressor failure. So I don't see any more in my side in carrier than I do other brands. So, um, all right. Uh, oversizing evaporators and condensers absorbs and rejects more heat thoughts, right? Well, Adam, there's, there's truth in both of those statements to a certain extent. Okay. Oversizing a condenser and an evaporator can have adverse effects too. So, you know, oftentimes they may oversize an evaporator coil in a, in a, in a situation where they have a really high latent load. I mean, they may do some weird things and essentially, you know, the higher sear ratings, um, essentially they just put in a smaller compressor and a bigger condenser, bigger evaporator and optimize the TXV for that system. So, there's, there's truth in it, but when you oversize it too much, you start to get into big problems. I wouldn't suggest trying to engineer your own evaporators and condensers. I'd leave that to an engineer or a proper design person to make those decisions because there could be a lot of adverse effects with that. You know, um, you could oversize it too much and, uh, you know, basically you, you could all cause all kinds of problems. So, um, what is the duct length limit for exhaust fans? Uh, dogs green. Well, it really just depends. I mean, there's not one set limit, just like there's not one set limit for a residential air conditioning system either. It really depends on the factors, right? So most of the time, the exhaust fans are set up to run and move um, so many CFMs of air within a certain static pressure rating, just like any fan that's moving air. Um, you know, exhaust fans typically are moving grease, um, you know, laden air essentially. So a lot of times, at least when it comes into the restaurant, so you have to have ducts that are designed, usually stainless steel ducts that are designed to allow for the proper movement of grease. And then also to allow for that grease to not get trapped within the ductwork too. Um, but I mean, I've seen restaurants, like I have a video of a captive air fan, no fault of captive airs where it was installed and the ductwork is like 150 feet long and the static pressure is like three inches of static. And the fan was designed for an inch and a half of static pressure. So, you know, the fan therefore doesn't move enough air. So it really depends on the, the static pressure rating of the fan and what the manufacturer specs, you know, the maximum static pressure rating is. So. Hopefully that helps you a little bit more. If I don't answer your guys' questions enough or you still have, you know, questions about it, feel free to send me an email to hvacrvideos at gmail.com, okay? Um, let me go ahead and get into here. Uh, does oversizing matter as much with inverter compressors? Paul. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to oversize whenever, right? Because even if you have an inverter compressor, that doesn't mean that you can oversize and not have to worry about the system sizing. And an inverter-driven compressor is meant to run within a certain design criteria. So don't think that you're going to get away with throwing in an inverter compressor on something that 
has an oversized ductwork or, or I'm sorry, oversized condenser or evaporator. Again, it all comes down to properly designing your system. So um, how do I like to leak check parallel racks and circuits? Ryan B. Well, I'm going to be honest with you right now that I don't do any large commercial refrigeration. So I don't do supermarket rack refrigeration, which is typically what you're referring to when you say parallel compressors. Okay. Parallel compressors usually have like a common suction header, common discharge header, and there's multiple compressors in a row. Um, and they may stage on and off depending on the load of the system. Uh, so as far as how do I check for leaks? Okay. Again, I don't really do any work for parallel systems, but ideally you would have to shut the system down. Uh, but with that comes some repercussions because you have a lot of other systems on that system typically, right? So you have multiple cases and different things like that. But honestly, I'm not going to go into the supermarket stuff because I, I understand, but I'm not very qualified to answer those questions. But I would imagine that you'd have to shut the system down, schedule a leak check and do a proper leak check then. Um, I guess you can shut down the fan. Yeah, there's yeah. Again, I'm going to stop talking before I back myself into a corner. So. Um, how would I consider the residential side of HVAC business stays soft if business stays soft? Oh, how would, okay. So I think I get what you're asking me, Ren, if I would consider going to the residential side, maybe if the business stays as slow as it is. Sure. I'd consider anything right now at this point. I mean, I was just talking to my wife about it yesterday, you know, like, Hey, if we got to do what we got to do, you know, I can start getting into this kind of work or this kind of work. So, um, you know, as far as the restaurant refrigeration goes right now, it's definitely slow. It's definitely slow right now. So, and I'm not the only company out there. Uh, it's pretty much across the board. The resident, I mean, the restaurant refrigeration companies are hurting right now and a lot of people are getting laid off. So it's a bummer, but um, how does roof curb size get calculated? Do you have an ideal preferred height transit biker? Well, again, this is more design questions, but I'm going to do my best to answer this. Okay. So a lot of times, at least here in Southern California, you have code inspectors and you have a planning department. The planning department typically wants your equipment to be hidden behind some sort of a parapet wall, meaning that let's say you have a restaurant, they don't want customers or houses that may be, you know, across the street or anything like that to have to see your equipment. So oftentimes they'll design the equipment to sit behind a parapet wall. Parapet wall is usually like a faux wall around the top of the building that hides the equipment. Sometimes they'll put a parapet um, fencing or something like that. So with that being said, the curb height is going to affect the height of the unit. At the same time, some other things you need to take into consideration with the curb height is, and this is the natural curb, is that you need to have proper airflow through that curb too. So if you're using a, 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 like a retrofit adapter curb, those create a problem because they typically add a lot of static pressure uh, to the duct design basically, okay? Because they don't allow for smooth airflow for the most part on the um, transition curbs. Now, if it's just a standard rooftop package unit curb that's built into the roof, so it's cut into the roof, oftentimes it's really just a platform, usually six to 12 inches above the roof deck to give you the ability to transition, you know, your duct work down into the attic. So for, if I had to say rule of thumb for most commercial air conditioning systems that I deal with, okay, not large industrial, your roof curbs are typically six to 12 inches tall. So, but it really depends on the design and uh, the airflow needed. Okay. Um, what do I do when refrigerant is leaking a lot, Mr. Johnny Boy? Well, if refrigerant is leaking a lot, you need to shut the system down and you need to find and repair the leak because there's a point at which a system's leaking too much. No matter how much gas you add to it, it's just going to keep leaking out. So you got to fix it. Okay. But there is other times, like for instance, I just went on a service call this weekend um, and I will release video of it eventually, but it was an emergency service call and we had a refrigerant leak, but it wasn't big enough for me to search for the leak at this time. So I just topped off the charge and got the system operational. Now, those of you that are watching from other countries, because there is some people in the European area that are watching these videos and these streams too, in the States, the United States, we have allowable leak rates. And uh, if our systems are usually uh, refrigerant charge 50 pounds or less, uh, we really don't have any leak rate laws that apply to us. So we're allowed to keep adding gas no matter what. Now, it's not ethically correct. You still need to talk the customer into fixing things, but it is allowable for us to just top off a system. All right. Um, 
Let me see. In my exhaust fan video, why didn't I install the hinge kit prior to running the electrical? Steven Mon Montanez, I actually addressed that question and it was just a mistake. That's all. So, um, am I ever going to use blue on refrigerant because I'm being a good sponsor even popped up before the live started? That's a really great question. So I'm going to tell you guys right now that blue on contacted me, um, about sponsoring my videos and I chose not to pursue that just because I really don't use any alternative refrigerants and I find it ironic though that they are advertising on my channel I kind of feel like they went around me and went directly to YouTube and said hey we want to advertise on this guy's channel so it's it's kind of I was actually just talking to my wife it's kind of funny like I chose not to work with them and it just seems like they wanted to advertise anyway so they went around me and just advertised directly through YouTube I don't know if I like it or not. It's not that I don't like blue on it. I've never used the stuff. I just chose not to work with them. You guys, I am my own worst enemy when it comes to sponsors and working with people because genuinely I am not in this for the money. Now, I'm not going to lie and say I don't make money. Sure, I make money from YouTube AdSense, um, but that's not the reason why I make these videos. And so I really pick and choose who I want to work with. Um, Sporlin is my sponsor for my stream. I mean, for my videos. And I love them because they're, they don't make snake oils. They don't make these weird products that I really don't believe in. Um, but again, I'm my own worst enemy because I not trying to brag or flex or anything, but people reach out to me and I usually don't even answer the emails just because I'm just, I'm not in it for that. Um, but it, it's, it does kind of irk me a little bit how blue on had been contacting me. I've got like probably three or four emails where they kept contacting me and then, now they're advertising on my channel inadvertently without me controlling it. So, yeah, you know, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. It's kind of kind of a weird space right now. So, um, uh, Mr. Johnny Boy, will I use Blue On to replace R22? No. I mean, maybe someday. I'm not going to say that I don't. I won't ever use the stuff. But right now, I use R22. I don't use any R22 alternatives. Um, if my customers asked me to, then I would present them with all the facts, give them my opinion about an alternative refrigerant. I'll be very honest with you. If I was going to use an alternative to R22, more than likely it would be 407C and I would do a proper oil change. Um, but I, I have nothing bad to say about Blue On. I'm, I'm not going to talk crap because I've never used this stuff. So, um, all right, let's see what else. Uh, what apple juice tonight? So I am drinking sparkling water from Costco. Um, guys, I don't know about you. Let's go ahead and get into this right now. So um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about on this stream, and I don't think anybody is addressing right now, okay, is what's going to come of all this craziness, right? Uh, I already have, have done several videos where I did the videos with my wife and talked about my mental issues. Um, I've gone through depression, that kind of stuff. I, you know, all kinds of diagnosed, all kinds of things. Uh, it was a struggle that I went to probably 10 years ago, but guys, guess what? Just because I went to the doctor and just because I was diagnosed, whatever, uh, and I took medicine for it. And I feel like I got better and I stopped going to the doctor doesn't mean that you ever stop fighting that once you have, you know, mental struggles, whatever it is, anxiety, depression, it stays with you for life. You just learn how to manage it. So with that being said, I'm struggling with it right now. I'm not going to lie to you and say that I'm not starting to go down a deep, dark hole. When things start getting bad, you really start thinking like, oh, my gosh, I'm not going to do anything bad. But I'm just saying like you, you, you really have to, to, to try to fight off that depression again and that. That, you know, uncertainty really is a gateway to, you know, that depression. It makes you scared. It makes you think twice. Um, I'm doing okay. Luckily, I have a support staff. I have my wife. I have my kids. I have my dad, my mom, my family, you know, that's there for me. And I really am okay. I don't need any help. But I do want to extend out my hand to anybody right now because I know there's so many other people out there dealing with anxiety and depression. And this does not help with anxiety and depression, what we're going through right now. OK, um, it's scary. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I can't say that I'm going to pick up my phone every single minute. I can't say that I'm going to be there to answer an email every single minute. But if, if someone needs someone to talk to, feel free to send me an email to HVACRvideos at gmail.com. OK, um, I have done this before. Uh, I have talked to people, believe it or not. I have not made any of this public, but I've talked to people. And the people that I've talked to, you know who I'm talking about. You're, you, you might even be in here. I've talked to people before and 
um, about things, you know, and uh, I encourage you to go see a doctor. If you guys are feeling upset or angry, go see a therapist or something like that. Talk to someone, even if you don't want to take medicine, just talk to a family member. You guys, the one thing about depression and anxiety and any kind of mental disorder, PTSD, all that stuff, the, the, the biggest problem with that stuff is when you don't talk about it, when you bottle it up. And I'm the kind of person that bottles things up. I bury it inside my chest and I don't talk about it. And then you explode or it eats you alive. So one of the biggest pieces of advice, and I am not a medical doctor whatsoever, but is to talk to someone. That's the first step. Okay. Talk to a family member, talk to a friend. Sometimes you just need to vent. Okay. Okay. If you guys can't get a hold of a friend or something like that and you just need to vent, send me an email, okay? And in fact, pay attention to the chat right now. There you go. I may be crazy, but in the chat right now. Oh, damn it. Hold on. That's the wrong number. Ha <laughs> Hold on just a second. In the chat. There you go. I just put my phone number in the chat. Feel free. Text me. OK, that's not my normal phone number. I'm not that crazy. I'm not giving out my phone number that I use for cell phone service every day. But that number is linked to me. I get messages. Send me a text message if you just need to talk. Leave me a voicemail. If I have time, I'll get back with you. Um, you know, but talk to someone because right now a lot of people are going through stuff and sometimes you just need someone to talk to. OK. Um, all right. I'm going to get to the chat a little bit more and see what I'm missing here. So uh, Paul L is the discord coming back soon would be a good way of staying active during the Corona mess. I'm going to be honest about the Discord. The Discord server, um, I had a Discord server. I currently have a Discord server. I have another one that I never made public. Um, and uh, Discord just became this thing. It was like I was babysitting. It was more of a problem for me on Discord than anything. So I don't know if Discord's going to come back. Um, it was kind of a headache, and it just turned into a big babysitting fest. And maybe, though, you know, maybe. Uh, let's see what else says someone with PTSD going through this pandemic with kids. It's heavy tax, heavily taxing transit biker for sure. You know, my kids, I got to be honest with them and share things. You know, one thing that I, uh, again, I'm not an expert whatsoever to talk about any of this, but I'm just going to say that, you know, I'm trying to, to, to give my kids some sort of confidence and give them some sort of sense of, you know, this is going to be okay. And of course I reassure them. My children are going to be fed. They have a roof. They're going to be safe, but you know, I, I, I have something to remember, and a lot of you guys remember this too. You guys remember 9-11 for the most part, right? Most of you guys do. 9-11 was a scary time, and I was on the West Coast, and 9-11 was scary for me. I remember being at work that day, and there was a plane heading for California. That's what the news was saying, and we didn't know where in California. And, you know, it was scary, right? Everybody in the, in the country and the world was scared when 9-11 happened. We all thought, what the heck? You know, that day, there was a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety, and, you know, um, it, it was a scary time when 9-11 happened that 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 whole year, the, you know, in the year following and the year following that was scary. But we, we survived and we came out of that and we got stronger from that. So, you know, we will survive this thing going on right now. We will come out of it. We will get stronger. But some of us are going to have a hard time coming out of it because, you know, a lot of people are losing their jobs and a lot of people no no fault to anybody. Right. But a lot of people don't have a lot of money saved up in the bank to, to weed out the storm and that kind of stuff. So, you know, this is a hard time for sure. So, again, I'll, I'll put my information in there and. Uh, again, there's my number. Feel free to contact me, guys, if you just need someone to talk to. OK. Um, all right. Yeah. 9-11 haunts everybody. Imagine for you, Justin, my moderator, because Justin lives in New Jersey. I mean, you know, for those guys on the East Coast that live in New York and that whole area over there. I mean, it's just, oh, gosh. But we came out of that. We will come out of this. OK. All right. All right. Uh, can a loose terminal connection at the secondary of a 480 to 240 volt transformer blow the one amp fuse? Can a loose terminal connection at the secondary of a 480 240 volt transformer blow the one amp fuse i would imagine so so you're saying on the 240 volt transformer side they had a one amp they only had a one amp fuse on a 240 volt so it's just a control voltage circuit that's interesting um balance tech i mean i'm sure it could any kind of a loose terminal but uh if you're the fact that you're asking me uh, makes me assume that you fixed it and you're doubting it so i mean there's always a possibility there's something else going on too um let me click on this. Yeah, there we go. Live chat. Much better. All right. Uh, 
for those of you that are uh, Jamie, you, you're in the UK. I mean, you guys are going through this like crazy too. You guys probably have it worse than us. So it's it's scary. Um, yeah, it it it's it's a hard time. So all right, uh, let me see. I'm gonna go through here right now. All right, um, look at what I'm missing here inside the chat. Again, questions, guys, put them in caps lock. Any quick safety tips on replacing compressors on R290 or just working on R290 in general? Rookie HVACR Adventures, yeah. Okay, so the biggest thing about R290, when we're working on R290 systems, is following proper refrigeration practices, okay? So that's uh, doing, uh, you know, being safe when you're changing the compressor or making a repair, okay? But when you work on a flammable or hydrocarbon refrigerant, you have a few extra safety precautions to follow. It's still the basic stuff. You're still going to evacuate your system. You're still going to leak chest your system. But you have to understand that your components that you use have to be specially designed for an R290 system, so you can't just grab an off-the-shelf compressor. Um, when you're working on the system, before you open up any R290 system, uh, before you apply a torch to it, I should say, is you, you want to do your best to cut components out whenever possible, but you can, you have to be practical and understand that there's going to be some times on an R290 system that you can't cut a component out. If you can make a cut before you do that, uh, you know, unsweat something, then, then that's best, but you definitely have to purge the system with nitrogen, make sure all the solenoid valves are open, give it a nice sweep with nitrogen and then have the nitrogen flowing while you're trying to unsweat something because there typically will be a flame out of some sort. Um, I have a couple different videos on R290 where I show the flame out. I had a compressor completely out of the system. And, oh my goodness. Um, thank you very much for that super chat, Jer Jerome Van G. I really appreciate that, bud. That, that's, I, I'm, thank you very much, man. But I hope that that doesn't put you in any kind of a bind, but thank you very much, okay? Um, so yeah, with the R290 systems, you know, have a fire extinguisher handy. And okay, uh, I guess I'm a pessimist when I say that I always try to assume the worst. So when I'm working on a system, an R290 system, I, I do, I assume the worst. I assume it's going to catch on fire. So then I think, what do I have to do to put out a fire if it catches on fire? That being said, wet towels, fire extinguisher, spray bottle, I have it all handy. Try to work in a ventilated area. Make sure that you're not trying to recover R290 because you you are you are supposed to just vent it into the atmosphere. Your recovery machines aren't meant to handle R290. Uh, definitely go check out my R290 videos. It'll give you all kinds of tips, okay? And if I haven't answered everything, send me an email to hvacrvideos at gmail.com. So, all right, let me see what else. Um, do you become a pilot or an HVAC technician? Well, I'm going to be selfish here, Paul, and I'm going to tell you to become an HVAC technician because we need all the help we can get. But it really depends on what's best for you and your family, okay? Um, that seems like a very extreme different career choice there, pilot or HVAC technician. Um, but HVAC technicians are going to be down and dirty. You're going to be busting your butt. It's not going to be an easy job. I'm not saying a pilot's an easy job. That's a very stressful, difficult job, I would imagine, too. But uh, we need every HVAC technician we can because our industry has a huge shortage of HVAC technicians. So uh, I love this trade and I will continue to do this trade. Um, it's amazing. So um, I have a question for you guys inside the chat real quick. Okay. Uh, answer in the chat. So in another life, right? In another life, not changing your family, of course. I'm not telling you to change your kids or your wife or anything like that. But hypothetically, if you were to wake up in another life, what would your career be? Okay. You can't choose the HVAC. What would your career be outside of HVAC? I've said this before and I use this a lot, but I would be a park ranger. I would be a park ranger in a national forest somewhere. Again, another life, you know, you, 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 you know, not saying that you want to change anything about yours, but I would be a park ranger. So I'd be curious what you guys in the chat would be. If you can't be an HVAC technician in another life, what would you be doing? So, um, I'd, I'd be curious to see your guys' stuff. You guys, I appreciate the super chats. Thank you very much again, guys, please do not donate if you guys don't have the means to. Okay. I, I totally understand everybody's going through a tight time right now. Okay. So thank you very much though. Um, Hey there, Bill. Curious HVAC guy. How you doing, bud? All right. Um, curious to see if they come in a CDL driver. Okay. Filmmaker. Okay. Um, gun runner, engineer, right on electrician, career military. Okay. All right. 
Military is another thing. I almost went down that path. I, I, I kind of regret not going the head of a cartel. There you go, Matt Gordon. You'd be a continued to be a soccer player. Okay. All right. Cool. A chef. Okay. You'd be a male stripper. That's a good one, Joe. Hey, uh, so my wife told me today that um, because uh, strip clubs are not considered mandatory, there was like a meme going around Facebook, and it said that now they offer uh, topless uh, uh, delivery, food delivery companies. So now the strip clubs are making food and they're offering topless food delivery. I thought that was pretty funny. I think it was a joke, but um, a police officer. Okay, game warden, rookie refrigeration. See, I would be a park ranger, so that's pretty close, dude. Have I ever replaced an AC drain pan and what's the process? Yeah, HVAC Smith. It really depends on what you're working on. So I've done a lot of the carrier package units, uh, and those ones are relatively easy. You just kind of lift up on the evaporator, slide the drain pan underneath. I've done the Linux package units. Um, I've I've fabricated drain pans for friends on residential A-frame coils. So I've done that many times too. Um, the owner of Amazon, yeah. Uh, all right, let me see what else we got in here. Have, have I done any videos on box repairs, floor or wall repairs for moisture infiltration? Infiltration. Um, I've never done any floor repairs. I mean, I've done walk-in door replacements and walk-in freezer door heater replacements where I place the threshold, but I've never done any, uh, replacements of the wall panels or anything like that. No, I don't even do those installations. If someone asked me to, I'll refer them to someone else, a firefighter. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, you're doomed. All right. Let me see what I'm missing here. You should have been a cop, HVAC grandpa. Um, okay, so I'm going to get to my list of things to talk about right here. Am I selling my shirts? Quality HVACR. No, I am not selling my shirts. So the story behind the shirts was last year I ordered shirts because I was going to sell them. And then uh, I placed a rather large order and realized how difficult it was to legally distribute them. And when I say legally distribute them... Um, because of Amazon, there's a new rule that basically says every single city pretty much can ask for sales tax revenue from your shirt sales. See, in the past, it used to be that you would only have to sell shirts where you had your nexus, which is the place where you live or store them. But that has been changed. So when I realized how difficult it was going to be to get it to have to file and pay sales tax to every single city and county, basically across the United States, uh, it turned me off completely. So no, I am not going to sell my shirts. Um, what I did was I ordered that big old supply and I actually gave them out on a live stream many, like a year ago and then, uh, just sent them to people. Um, you know, uh, so at this time I don't plan on selling my shirts. I have my design and, uh, I took them to AHR. So maybe for next year's AHR, I'll bring a bunch of shirts again, possibly and hand them out at AHR. But at this time I don't plan on selling them. Um, have I done any door retrofits? Chai HVAC. Yes, I have. I've done several door retrofits. I don't know if I have them on videos, but where I'll put pocket doors in, um, bolt on doors, that kind of stuff. I've done that many times. That's a very common thing we do where we take out the old door that's in the wall. We don't take out the frame. We just put a bolt on on and replace it many times. I can't remember. I don't think I've shown that on a video. So janitor in a peep show. That's funny. Um, all right, let me see. It's bad when there's a thick layer of ice on the top part of a walk-in freezer condenser. Is it bad when there's a thick layer of ice on the top part of a walk-in freezer condenser? It's a very good possibility. Um, send me a picture of that and let's talk about it a little bit more to hvacrvideos at gmail.com. That's my email. It's saying right down there next to the Streamlabs thing. Send me some pictures of your issue and then we'll talk about it through the email. Um, let me see what else we got. Uh, Nah, Tech Dan, it's just, if, if I miss your guys' question, just keep throwing them in caps lock, okay? It's because there's a lot of stuff going around. Uh, Tech Dan, I assume that there's a question that I didn't answer. Put it in there again, bud, because um, it's hard for me to scroll up and see everything. Uh, Bill, put sparkles in my beard and go. Oh, okay. You're talking to Bill. All right. Um, let me see what I'm missing in here. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on way above there. So Instagram model. Okay. So I'm going to get to my list of things to talk about. So, um, I already talked about the exhaust fan replacement with a crane lift, but I do want to cover that one real quick. So I showed some crane hand signals, right? Um, it's very important that, you know, you look at your local codes and you talk to your crane operator, because what I find is, is a lot of different crane operators kind of want you to use a few different signals between them. So, um, uh, shiny toe. Yes. Uh, yes, I have changed out a muffler bearing. That's my biggest thing that I sell to my customers all the time is muffler bearings. 
Uh, muffler bearings are my, that's, you know, we give, uh, we give perks to our guys for all the muffler bearings they sell. They get a $5,000 perk for every single muffler bearing they sell. So, um, Joe, thank you very much, man. We're doing okay. We're surviving over here. Hopefully the same with you, but all right. Um, AC tech, you said you had an HVAC helper blast you in the chest with coil cleaner, ripped off your shirt on the way to the restroom and rinse all the ladies were whistling. That's funny. <laughs> all right. Um, Okay, so I'm going to go anyway. So, yeah, I showed the hand signals on that crane video. And um, I'm sorry, I'm getting distracted by the chat. Have I ever been able to not complete a job due to it being outside my ability to diagnose? Rito Felix. I can't say that I've ever been mid-job and had to stop. But with that being said, I typically won't get involved in a job if I find that it's too complicated. So, like, for instance, I've had a customer, a hospital customer, call, call me for, like, an ultra-low freezer that had a weird refrigerant blend and I walked up to it and I looked at it and I said, I'm not qualified to work on this. I don't have the gases. You need to call a scientific company. And then I walked away. So, you know, I've done that where they've called me out and not given me a description, but I, I won't get involved and then say, oh my gosh, I'm not qualified to work on this and then stop. I'll usually know my limits before I start on something. So, um, let's see. How many guys work at my company, Joe Mama? Um, let's see, four trucks, including myself. So we have four trucks out in the field, including my own. So I have three service techs, well, two service techs and a maintenance guy out in the field. So, and everybody's sitting at home right now. Um, Volkswagen model cars are dope. Yeah, so those are actually Legos of all things. Hold on just a sec. This is one of my favorite ones right here. This is the Mustang. My daughter built this. I was going to say my daughter and I built this, but this one's a 67 Mustang, but it's all made out of Legos. It opens up. But um, yeah, she, she's all into Legos, so I started buying them. I was like, if I buy them, you build them. And then this one, of course, the Beetle. This is awesome. But again, Legos. And my favorite, this is like my dream car to own a bus, Volkswagen bus. This again, all Legos. These things are awesome, man. They're not cheap though. These are like a hundred bucks or something, but they're fun. All right. Let's see what else we're missing in here. Um, all right. So, uh, let's get back to this. The next video that I released was a walk-in cooler that wasn't cold enough and actually showed the equipment replacement. Now this was the first dual intelligent evaporator install that I did. Um, nothing too difficult about the dual intelligent evaporators. Um, the only difference is, is there's a few things like the, the startup is really easy. You only have to set up one evaporator and because they're, they're synced together via communication cable, you don't do anything with the other evaporator, but you just got to follow proper installation practices. Don't overpressurize a system like I have done in other videos. You'll ruin transducers and TXVs or TEVs um, or not TEVs, EEVs. That's right. Uh, but yeah, the, the biggest tip I can give you if you're doing a dual evaporator install with the Intelligent is you have to install shielded cable as a communication cable between the two. And if you guys don't already know, a lot of people don't understand. Okay, shielded thermostat wire right? Or shielded cable. It basically has a, a, a ground wire installed in it. That's the easiest way to put it. Okay. Very important. It, you have to understand that to properly terminate a shielded thermostat wire, you only ground one end of it and the other end, you do not land it on the ground terminal. Okay. I know that sounds counterintuitive because a lot of people think on a shielded cable, you have to ground both ends, but no, you don't. Okay. On a shielded cable like that, you only ground one end of the thermostat wire. So that's the biggest piece of advice I can give you with the Intelligent Startup. Other than that, don't electronically turn the system on until after you're done with your purge and your vacuum because they come uh, with the expansion valves already open from, insta uh, from the factory. So once you power them up, the expansion valves close, and then you have to do stuff inside the board to get them to open up to do your evacuation and everything. So... Uh, have I ever done any residential HVAC work? You'd love to see some videos on it. Paul L., you might end up seeing some of those soon as things get slow. I don't know. But no, uh, I mean, I've done residential for family members and stuff like that, but I've never done it through my business. But who knows? Maybe we'll have to get into the HVAC side on the residential stuff. So it's a very good possibility. 
Um, is relative humidity the sweat off my uncle's balls? That's an interesting question. I guess I see why you're asking that because it is relative humidity. Yeah, yeah, I guess I get that joke. All right, let's see what else. Uh, yeah, I wish I had a VW bus. Uh, quality HVACR, it's Zach, right? I'm pretty sure your name's Zach. I think it is. So I, I think I've called you Zach in emails and different things like that. But um, does Arizona heat strain compressors in the equipment I service? Well, first off, Drew Pierce, uh, I actually live in Southern California and I work in Southern California. Uh, not quite. Well, I, our weather's similar to Arizona. It's a little bit more humid here. Theirs is a little bit drier. Uh, they, we pretty much get the same temperatures in the summertime cause I kind of live out in the desert of Southern California, but, um, uh, they just have longer periods of heat. So, I mean, it's relatively close in temperatures. It's just their summer, you know, they, we typically have 110 degree in the middle of the summer for like a month and a half. Well, they have it for like three or three months. Okay. So, um, but yeah, the, the heat puts a strain on any equipment. Okay. When you have high heat outside, what it does is it causes your condensing temp to rise. When your condensing temp rises, your system loses efficiency. So, um, you know, any, any high heat situation puts a strain on equipment. Equipment has to be sized for your area. So therefore if my house, let's just say that my house required a three ton air conditioning system in Idaho. Okay. It would be totally different in California because of the heat load and the infiltration, right? The outdoor air temperature, the humidity, the, the wintertime temperature, all that stuff. So you, you have to design your equipment. You have to do a load calc on your building, your home, your commercial building, whatever it is, uh, to find out how to properly size your equipment because it may be oversized for longer run times. It may be smaller for shorter run times. There's all kinds of different factors that go into sizing your equipment. All right, let's see what else we got in here. You don't see me installing mechanical timers. Am I not a fan? Rito Felix. That's so funny that you don't see that because some of the questions that I get is, is why do I install so many mechanical timers? Um, lately, if I have a choice, I've been installing the key to therm temp plus defrost controllers on walk-in coolers, but I still use mechanical defrost timers all day long. The 8145 is like the industry staple. Uh, 814520 is the mechanical timer by Paragon. And then there's also the Graslin DTAV40. I use those all the time. So it really just depends. Um, let's see what else. What is the thing on top of my right cabinet with wires coming out of it? On top of my right cabinet. Oh, that is a hermetic compressor analyzer. Hold on just a second. So both of those are hermetic compressor analyzers. And what they do is they give you the ability via these dip switches to simulate different capacitors. So on a compressor, we typically need um, a certain size start capacitor to get it to start up, okay? And that particular box basically allows you to simulate different size capacitors to try to start a compressor. So if you go up to a compressor and it's not running, what we can do is put that analyzer on it and uh, we can potentially start it up before we drive to the supply house and buy starting components because it would either be a bad compressor or bad starting components. So with that box right there, it allows you to simulate starting components. Nowadays, I don't use those very much anymore because we have a little three-in-one start kits and I use those temporarily to try to start a compressor and then if I can get it to start and it runs fine then I'll go by the factory starting components for it so um do I still use that dial a charge or is it just for show yeah the dial a charge is just for show I have never used a dial a charge in my entire career um one of my technicians actually his dad bought that at a garage sale uh he doesn't work for me anymore but he had brought me that so Ren dude thank you very much for that super chat that's very awesome bud thank you thank you bud um Whatever happened to Fritz Rochester here on YouTube? I don't know what happened to Fritz Rochester. Uh, I, I honestly don't know. I wasn't involved. That was pre-YouTube before I was involved in it. Um, I know there was a lot of drama back then between a lot of the guys. There's a lot of the OG guys that were on YouTube. Uh, Zach, Ralph, um, Fritz, Steven, um, and John. Uh, they were all kind of around the same time. And so I don't know what happened to Fritz. Uh, just I don't know. You know, I don't really know much. I know a lot of people that know him, but I've never asked them about him. So 
I uh, used to watch his videos myself too. Have I ever encountered an oversized AC and what did I do? Baxter Jones, I have an oversized AC in my house. I have a four ton air conditioning system that the runtime on it when it goes into cooling mode is about four minutes and then it shuts off and then 20 minutes later it turns on again and then on and off and it just short cycles like that. So um, yeah, we encounter a lot of oversized systems. It's just something that I haven't chosen to replace in my house yet. I just deal with it. Same thing with the furnace. The furnace is probably a hundred thousand BTU furnace um, because it's a four ton air handler. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. It's, it's probably way oversized too. Um, so, you know, when you have oversized equipment, you're probably going to have short run times and you're going to have repeated short cycles. Basically, it's going to turn on, turn off, turn on, turn off. Um, there's other things that can happen too. If you're in a humid climate, we don't know what humidity here is in Southern California, but if you have an oversized system in a humid climate, you might not have proper humidity removal and you might have moisture and mold and crap growing on your walls and dripping off your ceilings and your windows and stuff like that. So, um, but again, it's really easy to operate with improperly sized equipment here in Southern California because our relative humidity in the summertime is like 30% or 25% or something like that. So we don't know what humidity is. Ever use a sling psychrometer, HVACR novice? The only time I've ever used a sling psychrometer was in school. Other than that, I've just used digital. Whatever happened to Jim Pettinato? Uh, Jim Pettinato actually commented on one of my videos uh, about a month or two ago. Um, so he's still out there and he's still just stopped with YouTube. Um, I've heard some things, but uh, it's, it's not fair for me to repeat them on here, but nothing bad. I just think he just chose not to be on YouTube anymore. That's about all I can say. Um, but he's still there. He, I think he, 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 he is active under his name, Jim Pettinato on YouTube, and he still watches my videos apparently. So that's kind of cool. Um, let me see. Uh, do I have a website? If not, am I planning to make one? Mr. Techrix. Uh, I have several domains that I own. Uh, a long time ago, I planned on making a website, but I never did. Um, so yeah, maybe a possibility, but it's just one of those things. I just kind of do things on my own terms. So um, I looked into it, but again, I start getting so obsessive about everything and everything has to be perfect. Like I'm, I'm not kidding with you guys. With these shirts, I've shown these before, but with these shirts, I, I'm, it's stupid how much money I spent designing these shirts with the person ordering samples having them tweak this ordering more samples it's stupid amounts of money that i spent and it's my own doing i'm just so obsessive about everything i try to control every single aspect and i am my own worst enemy when it comes to a lot of stuff so something like the website same thing it's just one of those things where i don't want to uh sometimes i just know it's better just not to do something right now so all right. Um, let me see. Have I ever watched Dr. Zarkloff? Yeah, I watched Dr. Zarkloff. He was one of the OG guys that I used to watch too. So uh, definitely an interesting character. Uh, there's some 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 good information you can learn from him. Um, but yeah, I, I used to watch his stuff too. Watched them all basically. Has anybody guessed the movie po new movie quote or the does the song? I know it should be popping up right now. So both of them were from 1996. I picked a song and an artist from 1996 and a movie from 1996. So. Um, uh, quick fix, uh, is oversizing an AC bad? Yes, it is. Adam HVACR oversizing is not good. Um, let's see. The Nylog debate has been brought back up for flares. What's my opinion? Nylog on flares or no. Yeah, I did hear the Nylog debate on the shop talk channel between, uh, Zach and Ralph and Justin. Uh, I am for Nylog. I use Nylog on my flares, but I know how to use Nylog on my flares. Guys, I also came up old school. It wasn't until about seven years ago that I still use Blue Death or Leak Lock, but I've never, ever in my career plugged something up because of Leak Lock. Leak Lock is the blue crap that turns hard and it seals a flare nut on. I, I was taught to use that in my entire career, but I was taught how to use it properly. You just apply a drop on the threads. You don't coat it. You don't get it in the lines. Same thing with Nylog. Even though Nylog is just refrigerant oil, I still don't get it in the system. I just put, I use Nylog more or less to lubricate the flare, the mating surface, and then put a drop on the threads and tighten it on. And then I use the torque wrench in my elbow, click, click, right? And I tighten it down to the proper torque setting. So um, not, not judging anybody that does it different, but yeah, I've always used Nylog. So, uh, what package units do I find hold up best in my service area? My favorite package unit to work on is a Linux L series package unit or the Energent series now. Um, those are my absolute favorite. They're like a, a, a Cadillac of package units. They're a luxury to work on. 
Uh, good stuff. Those are my favorite. That's just my opinion. Other people are more comfortable working on York package units. I prefer not to work on the York Predators, but, you know, it is what it is. Uh, is head pressure control valve and an expansion valve the same thing, Adam HVACR? No, it is not. Okay, a head pressure control valve is a device that's meant to maintain a pressure differential across your expansion valve. So a head pressure control valve essentially floods your condenser, raises your head pressure, creates a pressure differential to allow your thermostatic expansion valve to work better during low ambient controls or low ambient um, uh, conditions, essentially. So your thermostatic expansion valve is kind of designed to have a set pressure differential across it. Uh, older valves really, really require a set pressure differential. The newer ones that have multiple pins in them, they work a lot better, but you still need a pressure differential. Um, so yeah, that's a whole thing. I've, I've done many streams and podcasts talking about that. If you want some more information, send me an email to hvacrvideos at gmail.com. So, all right, let's see what else. Why aren't there more VR, VR, VFD, VRF systems in restaurant refrigeration? Because of the expense, Paul. Uh, most restaurants don't want to spend the money to uh, buy a system like that because the return on investment in a restaurant usually isn't there. Restaurants go through their equipment very fast um, and to go buy a big old fancy VRF system with all kinds of piping and circuit boards and different things like that in a greasy environment isn't going to last very long. So, you know, they just don't see the return on investment. Um, let me see what else. Uh, what rooftop units? I already answered that one. One ugga dugga, two ugga dugga. There you go. Uh, mine is a click click. My 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 elbow just clicks. So then we're good. Raising head pressure sounds like a bad thing. Yeah, you know, it, it can be to a certain extent. You hate headmaster valves. Let's just make this known right now that Prime Time is not a fan of headmasters. Okay, in case anybody didn't know already. I just messing with you, Prime Time. So uh, how old am I? I am thirty six years old, about to turn thirty seven in June. Um, let me see, uh, ever see any UV lights in commercial systems? Yeah. Uh, UV lights are very common in Manitowoc ice machines. Um, I've seen them in hospital settings and air conditioning systems, but never in restaurant refrigeration, air conditioning systems. No, I'm not a big believer in UV lights. And thank you for that transition. I'm going to go ahead and jump into this one right now. So because of the craziness that we're going to with the health scare and everything like that, there is a lot of people out there becoming a salesman, um, selling all kinds of things. I'm going to tell you right now, I've probably gotten into more internet arguments than I ever have in my time in existence on social media and all that stuff lately. Um, I probably need to bite my tongue, but sometimes I've been seeing some people and it's been really pissing me off. So I've been kind of voicing my opinion on things. I am not a fan of people giving false information about indoor air quality. Here, let me preface this and be careful when I say this. Indoor air quality is definitely something that people need to know, okay? They need to know that there's products out there that can help them with indoor air quality. What I have a problem with is people that are not qualified to sell indoor air quality, and they're going out there saying, I have this UV light, and it's going to kill the coronavirus, okay? They don't know that to be completely true, all right? Or COVID-19, whatever. Um there's a lot of misinformation out there, all right? Be cautious about what you are selling. I, I'm not saying that you can't sell UV lights. Sure, you sell UV lights, but just make sure that the customer understands that there's absolutely no guarantee that this particular virus that is going around right now is going to be killed by a UV light or whatever. And what else is a UV light going to do? Because I've read a lot of interesting stuff about UV lights causing other problems too, because yes, they kill things and they kill everything. So you sometimes need some of those things or people can get very sick too, okay? So I've been having a hard time with a lot of people selling all these products when they don't know that the products are necessarily true. Um, there was an interesting uh, YouTube video put out by uh, Nate Adams, the HVAC House Whisperer, or House Whisperer and uh, Michael Hausch and Retrotech. It was on YouTube. Just go to uh, Retrotech's YouTube channel and look up for this webinar, and they had some very interesting information. And in, in the webinar, they're not saying that indoor air quality products are bad. They're just saying that there's a lot of misinformation out there about indoor air quality products. A lot of the information that people use as like a fact sheet, like, hey, this kills these viruses, is printed by the manufacturer of said indoor air quality product, okay? It's not necessarily written by a third-party group, so you got to be careful about that stuff. 
there's a lot of misinformation and I'd hate for you to go out there and sell something to someone and make them think that that just because they have this product in their house, they're going to be safe. They might be safe. They might not. You don't know that. So just be cautious about that stuff. Um, yeah, poor people believe it. It's, it's bad. Okay. You got to be very careful about that stuff. Um, all right, let me see. Uh, how is my country dealing with the virus? Yours is currently in a smart lockdown, Netherlands. So, yeah, our country uh, pretty much from coast to coast is in some sort of a lockdown. There's not police standing outside our doors making sure we stay home, but they're basically strongly urging us to stay home. Don't go out in groups. Um, you know, basically try to slow down the spread of everything and the peak of everything. That's, that's the way our country is working right now. It's kind of going into pandemonium as far as financially, everybody's freaking out and stuff like that. And we're just taking it day by day. So, um, all right, let's see. Could I explain the difference between a TXV and a TEV? If there is one, of course, sure. A TXV or a TEV pretty much are the same thing. Okay, it's just a different acronym. So TXV was a common acronym for thermostatic expansion valve. But in all reality, if you think about it, the acronym TXV doesn't really make sense. The TXV, as, as much as my research comes from, was because people used to call it a TX valve. Um, and again, it still doesn't make sense. But TEV is thermostatic expansion valve. It's really the proper acronym. So they're the same thing. An EEV is electronic expansion valve. So that's the electronic one. A T or thermostatic, that just means it has a power head on it. So that's all. But TXV and TEV are the exact same thing. All right. Uh, if I miss something, guys, throw it in there again. I know there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, the marketing on Blue On seems effective. Everyone is asking about it. I know. And I kind of... Part of me kind of is like, maybe I should just work with them because they're advertising on my channel anyways, but I don't know. Um, all right. Uh, let me see what I missed in here. Would I consider doing more frequent live streams since business is quiet? Uh, yeah, it's a possibility. You know, I like to maintain consistency. Um, I have a pretty good backlog of videos for my normal videos. So I'm going to try to stay consistent with my two videos a week. I've been releasing them, uh, Sunday and Thursday has been what has been my track lately. And I'm still going to be consistent with the Monday night live stream. But uh, yeah, there's a possibility I might do another live stream. I was trying to get my wife to come in here and talk with me too because we've done some videos together. And maybe I'll get her on one too and she can talk about some of my anxiety and all that crap. And we can talk some more about that on a live stream too possibly. Okay. Uh, does leaving a walk-in cooler, walk-in freezer door open make the evap freeze? Is it because the system is overworking? Randy Williamson. Yes, it does make the evaporator freeze. What happens is, is you have warm air that is attracted to the evaporator coil, right? Because the heat is going to be attracted to it. And then that heat condenses or condensates the moisture condensates and the coil's really cold at the time too. So it starts to freeze up the evaporator that, and it just continually runs and runs and runs. And then even as that warm air is coming in, it's condensating on the evaporator coil and then it starts to build up ice particles and it freezes it up. So yes, leaving a walk-in freezer door or walk-in cooler door open is bad. It causes problems. Um, little off topic, best way to deal with working with a kiss ass, Matt Gordon. Um, well, I mean, it really depends, right? Because is he a kiss ass that's undermining you? Like that's, that's, that's causing problems. I mean, you, I think you just need to not worry about it. I know it's difficult and just stay your course, you know, uh, as an, as a boss, I know when people are kissing my ass and, you know, I may not say something about it, but I know what a kiss ass is. So, you know, uh, you don't have to like, say you're working for me and someone was kissing my ass all the time and talking shit about you. I know everybody's not the same as me, but I know when someone's talking shit and sometimes it just goes in one ear and out the other. And I don't even listen to what that person's saying, even though I may be acknowledging it, you know, it's just kind of like, eh, I don't have time to deal with that kind of crap. Um, but I mean, it's hard to say, dude, you know, I mean, if it's causing a problem with you, then you probably need to say something to your boss or something like that and say like, you know, this is just causing a problem in my work environment or something like that. Um, feel free to send me an email and talk about it more for sure. Um, ever work on ice cream machines? Uh, Andy, no, like, like shake machines and you know, things like that. No, I've never really worked on them. I've cleaned them. I've PM them. That's about it. Um, let me see. Uh, you hate the ads, Perry Raybuck. Yeah, I'm sorry, bud. YouTube throws ads in there all the time. 
Um, I, at the same time, though, I'm not going to lie. You got to understand that the ads do support my channel. The ads are a way to support my channel. But um, yeah, I have no control over who they use to advertise or anything like that. So ever work on ice cream machines? No, I already answered that one. Spring breakers partying it up in Florida and they don't care about. Yeah, I know. That's scary thinking about that. Kids. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard. All right. I'm going to get to my list right here. Um, ever work on, I already answered that one. Okay. Um, so I talked about the indoor air gadgets and air quality stuff, something I want to talk about. And I had a question about it. I've had a couple questions about it is my Spoilin BQ kit. Again, Spoilin is a sponsor, but I'm not bringing this up because of that. Okay. The cool thing about Spoilin that I really like about them is they don't push me to promote things or anything like that. I just promote things on my own, but I had a couple questions about people asking me where they can get the Spoilin BQ kit. So first off, I'm going to post a link in here that actually has part numbers for the Spoilin BQ kit. So here you go right now posting in there. You guys can click on that. That's a PDF. And uh, that'll take you to the part numbers for the Spoilin BQ kit. I'm also going to show it real quick. Just because people were asking. So I've shown this in videos many times. This is the expansion valve kit by Sportland. Okay. And what this allows me to do is pretty much build any expansion valve. So I have a bunch of power heads. I have a bunch of bodies. And we have a, a diagram right there that tells you how to do it. Um, I've got videos on my channel. If you look at my AHR videos, I like go through those. And I've shown people how to build them too. But that Sporland BQ kit is one of the most useful tools in my truck, especially in restaurant refrigeration, because I can pretty much make any expansion valve for any walk-in cooler, what refrigerant, no matter what. So that link that I just put in there is a PDF, and it has the part numbers for that BQ kit, because I had two people ask me before this about that. So that's why I threw that in there. Um, what have I done to clean oil from an evaporator in an eight ton AC system? You replace the TEV and flush. I would on a system like that, um, like, like I'm going to use a burnout as an example. When I've had a burnout, um, to clean the system out, what I did was I completely cut the evaporator out. So I cut the inlet and the outlet of the evaporator and then flushed it from each side until I got everything out of it. So in a package unit, I would think it would be the easiest to do that. Uh, do customers not care much on higher sear for commercial? You haven't heard much people talk about it. HVACR novice, no, because the return on investment for the most part is not going to be there for them to buy that higher sear unit. I'm going to be honest with you. A lot of times the return on investment, even for residential, I would in I would beg to argue that the return on investment typically isn't going to be there when people typically don't want to keep their air conditioner for 30 years. So, But again, I'm not an air conditioning salesman. I don't want to get nobody pissed off or anything. So... Um, the ad that came up on this vid for me was Blue On with Jim Bergman. That is so funny. Blue On is targeting. I, I said this in the beginning. Blue On is targeting my videos. Again, they reached out to me in the beginning and asked me to adver uh, asked to advertise with me, and I never answered their emails. They reached out like three or four times. And then everybody has been telling me that they're advertising on my channel like crazy. So they went around me, went directly to YouTube, and said they want to advertise on my channel. And they've been advertising on my channel. And the reason why they keep advertising on there um, is because they like the growth of my channel and all that stuff. So it just kind of, I don't know. It's, it's just one of those things that kind of irks me a little bit. Maybe I just need to work with them. Um, all right, let's see what else. Um, how often am I checking superheat? They really pushed it in school, but they haven't seen many people check it while you're apprenticed. I mean, it really depends, Randy, what I'm working on. So if I just walk up to a walk-in that has low charge, I'm going to I'm gonna fix it, clear the sight glass, and start it up. I may or may not check superheat as long as I'm not having any kind of weird frost pattern, patterns or anything like that. Um, on an air conditioning system, I'm probably going to check superheat and subcooling a little bit more because if I'm trying to charge it properly, but typically I'm going to weigh the charge in and then check vitals after that. Um, am I offering evap cleanings to my customers? Uh, Ren, my customers aren't asking me for anything right now. At this point, they're not doing any air conditioning repairs, period. They're only doing refrigeration because of this craziness. So, um, let me see. Ever work on any VAV boxes? No, Ryan, I have not. Um, let me see. Yeah, Blue On is going in hard on YouTube. So Blue On actually has some huge investors. And, and I'm going to name one. I know that Leonardo DiCaprio is actually one of the investors for Blue On. And then there's some super big female actress, too, that's a huge investor in Blue On. So their marketing is on point for sure. Um, all right. Is a complete R22 ban likely in the United States? No, absolutely not. We don't ban things like that in the United States. They're going to phase it out, but it'll never, it won't become illegal. No. Um, 
All right. Hey there, Isaiah. How you doing, bud? All right. I'm going to get to my list of things. So um, remember something, guys? I kind of talked about this a little bit in the beginning, but we are all going through this together. Okay. Everybody's going through this struggle. It's a hard time right now, but we are all doing it. I know that doesn't ease your guys' worry or your pains. Again, I said this in the beginning of the stream. You guys, my email address, feel free to reach out to me if you just need someone to talk to. Um, I'm going to type it in right now. There's my email address, and then here's my phone number. Now, this is not my personal cell phone, but this is directed to my cell phone. If you guys just need someone to talk to, send me an email, leave me a voicemail. I have definitely try to return some of the calls if I can, okay? What I'm pointing out is, is that the people that are going through things and just need someone to talk to, I don't want anybody to do anything stupid. Sometimes it just takes that one person to answer the phone or to say hey to, to make someone think twice about, you know, how dark their things are going, right? We're all going to make it through this. It's going to be a struggle, you know, but again, we're doing this all together, okay? So anybody out there that's struggling, you guys know what I'm talking about. I've dealt with the depression and the anxiety and you know all that stuff. I kind of already talked about that, but again, I want to reiterate that. There's my email, there's my phone number. Send me an email, send me a text message, whatever. All right. Um, one of the things that we're finding while everything's going on, for instance, I went to a, a major restaurant chain this weekend, is they're not doing follow up repairs right now. So you know, I always preach big picture diagnosis. I always preach look at the big picture, you know, solve the problem, not the symptom, right? I still do that. I still diagnose with big picture diagnosis, but it doesn't necessarily mean the customer is going to go for the big picture diagnosis repair, right? I had a customer this weekend that's really, really struggling, a big restaurant chain, and they're really hurting right now because they are, don't have any dining rooms open across the nation. And they, uh, they basically said, do what you have to do to get it working and leave it be. So I had to make, I had to change a condenser fan motor, do a temporary electrical repair that was not kosher. I mean, I took the conduit out completely. The wires are just hanging there nice. And, I mean, I tried to secure them as best as possible, but, um, and I topped off the charge and they don't want me looking for leaks. So I'm still not going to stop with my big picture diagnosis. I'm still going to give them the big picture. I'm going to take notes. I'm going to evaluate everything, but you just have to accept the fact that sometimes these people are only going to go for the temporary repairs right now, just because times are tight. So, you know, I can't be out there selling them everything. You know, I'm going to give them all the options and ask them what they want to do, put it in their hands. Nothing's changed. I mean, that's how I've always done it. I've always gone to my customer and said, this is what I found wrong. These are your options. And they always chose to do what I recommended, which was the big picture repair. Um, but right now they're kind of backing off on that a little bit. So um, I'm going to talk about this. So I had a lot of, I had actually three different people ask me about how to become an air conditioning and refrigeration technician. So very, very big topic right now, right? Um, what I suggest to, to, to get into the industry, if you want to become an air conditioning and refrigeration or an HVAC R tech, okay, is to look at your local community college. Okay. Right now things are a little bit interesting, but you know, when things calm down, look into your local community college. The reason why I push the community colleges is because they typically have night classes, meaning that you can work a normal job during the day, go to school at nighttime, get in a semester. After you get a semester in or so, I suggest you go knock on an HVAC company's door and ask them if they're hiring. The reason why I say is get a semester in or even a class in is just to show them the initiative. Hey, I'm interested in this trade. I've been going to school. I'm not finished yet, but I'm still going at nighttime. Would you be interested in giving me an apprenticeship position? That would be my suggestion on how to get into an HVAC company because if someone came knocking on my door while they're enrolled in school and said, hey... I'm looking to be an apprentice. Would you consider hiring me? I'd much more consider hiring him over the guy that just emails me and says, hey, I'm interested in the trade. What do I got to do? You know, it just shows initiative. So I suggest. Now, when things are weird like this, I highly suggest, and I'm going to get to the chat in a minute. I'm kind of ignoring it right now. What I highly suggest is research, research, research. Right now, there's not a community college that's having sessions at all. Everybody's out of school right now because of the craziness, right? So do some research on your own. Check out my buddy Brian Orr's website, hvacrschool.com. Don't confuse Brian with me. A lot of people do. Brian and I are two different people. I operate HVACR videos. Brian operates HVACR school, okay? Um, but anyways, uh, go to his website. He has lots of great training resources, 
Um, also look up rses.org, another great training resource. Um, ESCO Institute is another great training resource, ESCO. Just look them up. You'll, you can Google them and find all kinds of information. There's lots of great information out there. Okay. So I highly suggest anybody that's interested to get into the HVAC trade. All right. Let's see what else I'm missing in the chat that I missed. Um, I'm going to start right here at this one. Any tips on how to convince customers to replace or upgrade larger equipment that's 40 years old? Car okay, that's a really hard one. Essentially, just giving them, you know, if you can go to them with a, a, a you know, a printout of the last repairs you did the last year, this is how much money we put into this equipment this past year. Um, this is how much money it's going to take to run this, to, to do this equipment. Now there's also software programs that can show them energy usage analysis and say, you know, this thing costs you this much a year to run. And then you can show them what the new equipment will off offer. Um, those are the best tips that I have about selling larger equipment is just give them all the facts and let them make the decisions. So ever had a refrigerant burn many times, HVACR novice, I've had burned out compressors for sure. Many, many times. Um, uh, I'm just doing for fun. Pablo hurts. Uh, kind of. Yeah. Um, okay. Good God. Stop touching. I know my nose is freaking itching like crazy. I have Coke nose right now. I don't know what's happening. Oh my God. My fingers are touching my face. Oh yeah. I know it's horrible. Um, all right. Let's see what else. Uh, how do I calculate makeup air unit and exhaust fan balance? Adam HVACR. That's a really technical question. Um, send me an email, hvacrvideos at gmail.com. But essentially, your makeup air um, typically needs to be pushing in just a tiny bit more air than the exhaust fans are pulling out so that your building will typically run a little bit positive. Um, but it really depends on the application you're in. So um, uh, let's see. What do I think about the Sensi Predict product? I'm really interested in the Sensi Predict product. I kind of like to get my hands on one and have it at my house for a while. What I am not a fan of is the way that they're selling it. They're selling it as a way to stop service calls, essentially. And, you know, they call it truck rolls to limit truck rolls. Eh, I, I honestly am still a firm believer in service technicians getting out there and getting their hands on the systems. So I'm not a huge fan of the whole stopping truck rolls, but I like the information that Sensi Predict gives you at your fingertips. Um, I One thing that I don't know about, though, is that I don't know if the contractor is going to have access to that information or if it's just going to be emailed to the customer and then the customer calls the contract. So I, I'd like some more information about Sensi Predict, but it sounds like a cool product. I like I like numbers. I like seeing graphs and different things. So um, good gosh, my nose is itching. OK, you mean on my skin refrigerant burn myself? OK, so frostbite. All right. Uh, let's get into my. Uh, uh, training materials. Again, I already covered. Call, go check out HVACR School. Another great resource for training materials is Sporlin.com. Okay. Sporlin.com. Again, they're one of my sponsors, so give them some props. Sporlin also has a great YouTube channel. Just look up Sporlin Video on YouTube. Um, they've got great information on there. Lots of tech tips and lots of cool training videos on Sporlin's website also. So definitely check that out. Um, have I ever had a Freon burn on my skin? HVACR novice. Yeah, I have. It's not a big deal. So, um, Chris may be going through apple juice withdrawal. I know the symptoms. Uh, you know what? You could be absolutely right because I am jonesing for a beer right now. It very well could be apple juice withdrawal. I am jonesing. That's another thing too, guys. So talking about the anxiety and the depression and all the craziness that's going on right now, it's really easy for us because we're bottled up, stuck in our house to sit there. And for me, Guys, this is going to sound crazy, but for me, I've been drinking a beer every night. That's that's a lot. I don't I really don't drink that much. I mean, if I have one or two beers a month, that's about normal for me. So to drink a beer every night, I'm starting to like second guess myself. So maybe maybe I should be more honest about two beers a night, maybe three beers a night. Maybe maybe three beers every other night is what I've been drinking. But yeah, it's it's starting to, to, to add up. So it's just one of those things you have to be conscious about, especially when you deal with mental things like I do. You don't want to go down a deep, dark hole with that. So, all right. Um, I had someone send me a comment on YouTube. Andrew actually said in a comment that critical thinking has become a lost process in society. Um, and that was an interesting comment that he said. And he was talking about just critical thinking in general, like I use big picture diagnosis, right? And I do kind of agree with him that, you know, a lot of people are in such a rush these days that they're not stopping to look at the big picture. And that's what I'm trying to do with these videos. I think that is my mantra that I'm trying to get out there is, is just stop and look at the big picture. 
a lot of times when you're struggling with something, I've said this many times, if you're working on a system and you're having a really hard time fixing it and um, you're struggling and you can't figure it out, sometimes just stepping back for a minute and thinking about it. Okay, wait, 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 start from the basics. Okay, I, you know, sometimes you can get lost and you can go down a rabbit hole and it just takes to step back and think about it for a minute, okay? But in general, I like that comment, you know? I hate to say that, that it's true, but I mean, generally critical thinking is kind of a lost art these days. So we need to kind of get back to that. Um, we need to start looking at it and thinking about it logically and trying to solve problems that way. Um, liquor sales up more than food for sure, man. That's scary. What's my favorite pint glass? Um, my favorite pint glass. I mean, I would have to say my spoiling one. I, I love those spoiling pint glasses. I have a whole bunch of them. Hold on. I don't know if you were asking me about that, but there's the Sporland pint glass. I love these little things. These things are cool. Um, my favorite beer right now is Rogue Hazelnut Brown. It's made by Rogue, Rogue Brewing Company. I believe they're out of Oregon, I think. And uh, the Hazelnut Brown, because I'm a brown ale fan, so, uh, you know, like a Newcastle. So the way I can describe a Rogue Hazelnut Ale, it's like mixing in a bit of coffee in a, in a Newcastle. It's kind of like that. It's got like a dark, rich kind of an oaky flavor and then it just has kind of a coffee flavor to it too that is my favorite beer right now um all right let's see what i'm missing uh why do restaurants have separate gas heat exchangers instead of using the ac units uh as heat pumps especially considering how mild my climate is paul l the biggest reason why we don't use heat pumps very much here in southern california is because we have an energy shortage in the summertime our our electric grid sucks and uh we typically try to do um uh, gas heat, uh, just to try to save any energy, which kind of is counterintuitive because we're not using as much electricity during the winter, but I don't know. That's, that's just always been the, the answer I've been given why we don't have more heat pumps. I, I would probably say 85 to 90% of my systems out there are gas heat. And then the 10% or 15% might be heat pumps. We don't have that many heat pumps, uh, mild climate. We could get away with that for sure, but it's just about saving energy really is my opinion. Any updates on my new channel? No, just me being lazy. I'll get to it, though. I know I keep saying that. Uh, you used to stop and smoke a square and then stare at a unit for a bit. Yeah, I mean, sometimes the best thing. Business stays slow. It will be Milwaukee's best. Uh, as in, uh, oh, okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Getting to the cheap stuff, the piss beer, for sure. So, all right, um, let me get to my list right here. Uh, how do I approach a system with no refrigerant markings and how do I approach mixed gas? So first off, if I walk up to a refrigeration system and there's no markings on it as to what refrigerant it might be, what are my investigative processes? So first off, I'm going to look at the condensing unit, look for any fading, faded markings, open up the electrical cover, look at that. I'm usually going to start by looking at the refrigerant oil in the system. Okay. If it has mineral oil or alkabenzene oil, I'm going to lean towards an R12 system or an R22 system. If it has polyester oil, we're going to lean towards R22, 404, um, or something like that. And I guess I should say mineral oil, we might be leaning towards 502 also. Again, I come from the old school time and we had those refrigerants. Nowadays, though, with our new air conditioning systems, if we're going up to an air conditioning system, I've had people mix all kinds of things. So you start with the compressor, what kind of oil it has in it. That kind of gives you an indication. You look at the system and you just kind of analyze things. Um, as far as how do I tell if it has 407C or R22 or MO99 or whatever inside of it, that gets to be more and more difficult, okay? Using a temperature pressure chart has some validity to it or val... Uh, anyways, that's such a stupid word. Has some um, use to it essentially, but it can be a little bit difficult difficult when you're dealing with blends, okay? Um, you can also go down if you're working on a refrigeration system and look at the expansion valves. But again, with all these new blends, even if you have an R22 expansion valve, doesn't mean that the system has R22. So in that situation, if ever in doubt, I'm just going to take it out and start over. I'm going to I'm gonna usually go to the customer and say, hey, you've had a bunch of people working here. I don't know what refrigerant's in here. We're going to start over. You're going to let me evacuate the system. We're going to put new refrigerant in it and start from scratch. That's my method. I know there's a lot of other methods. But that's that's just the best way that I have is, is looking at it, investigating. If I can't find any markings or if it looks like a million people have worked on it, I'm just going to quote to go ahead and replace the refrigerant and start over. Um, all right. 
Is a walk-in freezer a good anti-coronavirus bunker? Uh, I wouldn't say so. Um, let's see. Um, okay, I'm not missing anything as of yet. I'm going to get to my list here. Uh, direct drive motors on exhaust fans. So I had a question why we use so many direct drive motors. I think a direct drive motor on an exhaust fan is the stupidest design ever. I'm a belt driven fan for sure. But the reason why the industry is going to direct drive is to save money. You know, the manufacturers can design these air conditioning systems with a direct drive motor coupled directly to the blower wheel. You know, an exhaust fan, they can put a direct drive motor and the selling point to the customer is you don't have to change belts. So, but it creates a problem because if you have a direct drive exhaust fan motor, oftentimes it means you have to go with the OEM motor because they design them weird. The mounting brackets are weird and it makes it difficult to find a replacement motor. I love the old school stuff of just a standard 56 frame exhaust fan motor with a pulley on it and a belt because you can pretty much buy any brand motor and make it work. So why we're doing that is, is just because the manufacturers are trying to save money and possibly trying to sell more parts. All right. It is all about throwaway these days for sure. Um, Alex had asked me the lifespan of an evaporator coil. Like what is the typical lifespan? And I sent him an email, but I'll talk about it on here too. So in the past, if you had evaporators that were and condensers, equipment essentially that was made, you know, 1980s or previous to that, oftentimes you could get 20 to 30 years out of your equipment. Uh, 90s and up, your equipment started to taper off. If you get something and you buy it today in 2020, uh, your your shelf life on your equipment typically is going to be 10 to 15 years at the most, oftentimes less than that. So you just can't buy quality these days. It's just one of those bummers. So, um, all right, let's see what I'm missing in the chat. Uh, am I asked to take responsibility for product loss after I service any equipment? I have in the past, and I have had to take responsibility for some stuff that I totally messed up. Uh, one time, this was early in my career, it was actually me that made this mistake. We were changing a door on a walk-in freezer, and we left the equipment off. And again, we ended up splitting the difference with the customer because we had a valid argument. I left the equipment off and I left at like two o'clock in the afternoon and they called me at two o'clock the next day and said my walk-in cooler at the time, my walk-in cooler is at 65 degrees and we found the switch off outside. Well, it had been off for almost 24 hours and the customer didn't take the initiative to go look and check the temps inside the walk-in. So I ended up splitting the cost of all the food inside that walk-in with them. Okay. Uh, that ended up costing like 2,500 bucks or something like that, or it was some stupid amount of money, but yes, I have had to purchase equipment. That's been about one time. I think there was another time where maybe like a refrigerator or something like that. And it was a mistake that we made, but for the most part, I won't do that anymore, you know, because you got to put some blame on the customer for that too. Even though we left it off, they should have been checking their temps and things like that. So, uh, finally you read something. Oh, okay. Sorry. How to tell the difference between temperature glide and expansion valve hunting. Chris Cooley. That's an interesting question, man. I will have to think about that one, Chris. Send me an email to hvacrvideos at gmail.com. Let's talk about that one. Um, let's see. All right. Anybody get the movie? I, I don't know. The chat's been moving so fast. Did anybody get the song or the movie quote? Throw it down in there if anybody got it. You should have gotten the movie quote by now because the easiest one popped up. But I'm curious if anybody got the song. Um, post, post it down in there if you guys did. I'm curious. Uh, let's see. Um, again, I said this in the beginning of the stream, guys, and I'm going to say it again. Many of you guys have, uh, many of you guys have supported me on YouTube or Patreon or, you know, whatever, whatever methods. And guys, I'm not going to fault you guys at all for pausing or turning off that support right now. It's totally cool. So please don't hesitate to stop your contributions, your support, whatever. Because a lot of that, like for those of you that don't know, Patreon is a reoccurring charge every single month. So someone usually commits to like 10 bucks a month and it reoccurs. Guys, don't hesitate to stop that stuff right now. You need to think about your family. Don't worry about supporting me, okay? So I encourage you guys, if you guys are supporting me, pause that stuff for now until things get better, okay? Because I don't want to be taking your guys' money that you need for whatever later, so... What happened to my Discord channel, Chris? Uh, I just shut the Discord down because it was too much babysitting. Um, I've considered starting it back up a little bit different, but it was just ridiculous, the babysitting we were having to do and arguments and different things. It was just kind of silly. Um, 
All right, let's see. Uh, what happens to evacuated refrigerant? Is it recycled? Uh, recovered refrigerant. Evacuation is when we put a vacuum pump on there and we clean the air out of the system. Uh, recovery is when we take the refrigerant and put it into a cylinder and then we take it to a supply house and they're supposed to send it off to get disposed of properly where they destroy it and make it so it doesn't harm the ozone. Honestly, it's some voodoo magic. I don't know what they do. Um, all right, let's see what else. <laughs> right on, Joe. I really appreciate it, bud. Uh, I know everybody's getting blue on ads. It's really making me question that right now. I, I don't know how to. Yeah, I know. All right. What is Discord? Uh, Zach, so Discord is kind of like it's a giant chat room that you can control and have different rooms in. And it's, you know, you basically have your own server where people come to your specific thing. And then it's just like a giant Facebook chat room, basically. But it just turned into a bunch of drama. And I, I just deleted the whole server. So how to tell if you have a microchannel condenser. So a microchannel condenser, stellar heating and cooling, that's a really good question. You're probably going to need to take a picture of it and send me uh, an email with the picture to hvacrvideos at gmail.com. But generally, a, a microchannel condenser is aluminum, and it kind of looks like a radiator on a car. That's the best I could describe it over audio and video right now. So um, uh, you are correct, Ike. That is why I need moderators for sure. So... Um, yeah, definitely. Ike is actually the one that uh, has, we haven't made it public, but Ike has actually set me up a Discord server that I may end up releasing, but it's still private for the time being. So, um, all right, let's see. Uh, please take one for the team and try Blue On, please, Nate. <laughs> Maybe. You know, Blue On needs to send me a damn drum with all the advertising they've been doing on my channel. Again, guys, the Blue On ads have nothing to do with me. They're going directly through YouTube. Again, I said this in the beginning of the stream, but... Blue on approached me and I never answered their emails just because I really didn't want to work with them. And so they went around me and went directly to YouTube and are advertising on my channel through YouTube. So I find it kind of ironic. Um, they went around me. Um, let's see. You pull that shit on your banana. I'll take the gun list over here. I'll tell you the gun goes quack. Good riddance. Is that um is that training day? Honestly, I'm not, I don't know if I can get that one or not. Uh, uh, Rich R, it's a possibility. That's what I did in the past was give out the shirts and then some people sent a donation, some people didn't. We might do something like that again. Uh, can I explain a triple evacuation for HVACR service technicians? I sure can, and you're going to get my opinion on, on this too. A triple evacuation is useless these days, okay? We don't need it anymore. The whole point of a triple evacuation was a way to try to dry a system out when we didn't have good equipment or didn't know how to properly use our equipment. So a triple evacuation was you would vacuum down for a certain amount of time. You would break that vacuum at the time with either R12 or R22. Then they changed it to nitrogen. But in the beginning, it was you break it with R12 or R22. And then um, you would pull the vacuum again, and then you would break it again by purging R12 or R22 through. And then you would do a third evacuation and pull down to your final evacuation. Now, as the EPA laws came in in the 1992 era, they changed that to nitrogen and told you to, you know, break the vacuum with nitrogen. But we don't need that anymore. There's a triple evacuation is pointless these days because if you have a good vacuum pump and you properly place your micron gauge, you set it, pull down to microns, check your decay, and there's no need for a triple evacuation. So... Um, if you need more clarification, send me an email. Have I installed voltage protectors for VFDs, especially for places with dirty voltage? If so, what do I install? No, I have not, Richie, because the customers never want to pay for that stuff. Um, I don't. I would consider looking into the, some of the ICM products. I don't know how, what quality they have, but I actually I have done a voltage. Good God, my nose is itching. I have done a voltage monitor, um, like a phase monitor from ICM, but um, I've never done anything other than that. So. All right. Can I convert a refrigerator from R600 to R1234YF? I have no idea, Adam. I don't know if that's a, a possible conversion. I probably wouldn't try that. Um, zero ads. Las Vegas vocalist. And I appreciate that. I understand what you're doing with that. But also another thing to think about is when you turn the ads off, we as creators don't get any revenue from that. Because if it's not showing the ads, we don't get revenue. So it's kind of that catch-22 you know, I appreciate when you guys do watch the ads because it does help out the stream and the channel. Um, all right, guys. Verve Pipe Freshman is the song. That is right, Andy. So did anybody get the movie? I know I probably missed it. Someone probably put it in there. But all right. Um, all right. I'm sure someone did get the movie. 
And uh, okay, gentlemen. So I want to say that, you know, with everything going on, just remember, guys, that take it easy. You know, remember about, you know, think about your family. Spend some time with your family. Um, be be cautious where you guys are working. Make sure you're following all the stuff, washing your hands, doing all that stuff, okay, as usual. Um, I really, really appreciate you guys taking the time to watch my videos and to watch my stream. Um, you know, I, I'm going to close this out with the same thing that I always say or I try to say as much as possible. As if you guys can take one thing from my videos, one thing from my live stream, any of that stuff, is please, please, just take a step back and look at the big picture. That's that's it. As simple as that, guys. Take a step back and look at the big picture. Even if the customers aren't going to take the big picture quote, take a step back and look at the big picture. It's going to make you a better technician. Guys, be safe out there. Be careful. I'm going to close this out. Thank you very much. And again, feel free to send me an email to hvacrvideos at gmail.com and or text me or leave me a voicemail if you guys need to talk. The number is 909-238-9094. Okay? Really appreciate you guys, and I'm going to go ahead and close this out. Thank you.